Hello, I'm Yvette Torres, and welcome to another edition of The Road to Recovery. Today, we'll be talking about providing treatment and support in rural and frontier communities. Joining us in our panel today are Dr. Anne Helena Schinstad, clinical professor at the Department of Community and Behavioral Health, University of Iowa College of Public Health, and program director of the National American Indian and Alaska Native Addiction Technology Transfer Center, Iowa City, Iowa. Walter Castle, Senior Public Health Advisor at the Division of Behavioral Health, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Indian Health Services, Rockville, Maryland. Mary Aldred Crouch, Manager of Substance Abuse Treatment Services at Cabin Creek Health Systems and President-Elect of the West Virginia Association of Alcoholism and Drug Addiction Counselors, Milton, West Virginia. Dr. Karen Francis, Principal Researcher and Chair, Diversity and Inclusion Council at the American Institutes for Research, Washington, D.C. Welcome to the show. Mary, what are some of the challenges that are faced by people in rural and, and frontier communities as they try to address their mental and or substance use disorders? In West Virginia, there are a myriad of issues. Um, primarily, the, the biggest issue is transportation um, because there are rural parts of the state that literally have no public transportation. Um, we've got an enormous workforce issue because there are some areas where the, it is remote enough that there are not um, medical providers, behavioral health providers available um, so that without you know technology to assist providing services there are none unless they can travel you know a hundred miles which is incredibly difficult because it's very mountainous you know rural terrain. Um, funding obviously is an issue with you know without insurance or with um, under insurance meaning that the premiums are high and the deductibles are um, very high as well. Um, culture a lot of times in the rural um, communities they have a, a culture that dictates that they rely on their families mm -hmm. first mm -hmm. um, and then on their church if they have to turn to help so that people are loath to turn to professionals either for medical or behavioral health so that they don't access health even if it is available. Thank you. Uh, and Helena, does that, are those issues compounded when we talk about Indian country? In Indian country there are, depending on what kind of tribal community we're talking about, there are a lot of infrastructure development issues like roads, like um, access to care, like educational level, and a lot of poverty issues that make people have a hard time trusting the treatment system. So <clears throat> they would go to their spiritual leader, they would go to their community, their medicine men much more and quicker than going to the traditional treatment center. Very good. Walter, you also work with Native communities, and, and what types of issues do we see in terms of mental and substance use disorder? Is it just alcoholism and depression, or are there other issues? There are other issues. It's a microcosm of, of society. Uh, you'll find that you know there, there's, there's alcohol abuse and substance use disorders along the lines of methamphetamines. We're struggling with that. We're seeing some increase with heroin along with everybody else um, and the opioids. Um, as far as behavioral health, uh, there's the depression, anxieties. Um, we see a lot of uh, trauma uh, kind of based on historical trauma that, that, that has occurred. Um, and, and so that tends to kind of look similar to what you'll see with PTSD at times. Um, so the, the anxiety is there. Um, a lot of the trust issues as well, which makes it difficult, I think, um, to, to engage at, at, at some levels. But um, it's, it's, you would see they're, they're not really different in regards to, you know, the types of, of mental health issues along with the substance abuse issues as well. 
And Karen, dealing with with the systems aspect of, of this, how similar are the systems within mainstream society versus the rural? Are, are, are they, they similar or should they, are, are they different in terms of, we've already heard about the, the problems, you know, in transportation and in getting to the services, but the services themselves. You know, so, so we often talk about if you've been to one rural community, you've been to one rural community, right? There are there are no two that are the same. And, you know, there's been research done um, by the Carsey Institute, University of New Hampshire, that, you know, identified, you know, socioeconomic, ec um, you know, cultural as well as demographic um, underpinnings that define what a variety of rural communities look like, um, you know, focus on issues around the declining um, economic situations in some rural communities, the um, the abundance of resources in some rural communities, as mm -hmm. we know in some of the, you know, across our country in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, where many of us take vacations quite often, mm -hmm. um, you know, and then they are some of the um, other communities that are, you know, growing, um, but then there are still some issues around economic stability and those types of things. So I think that as we look at these rural communities, it is important to understand that none of the two are the same. We can't compare them. And, um, you know, it's really a unique issue that we're dealing with. But within those unique mm -hmm. issues, the 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 structures the the availability of clinics would you say is is up to par or or are there are there less uh, services, particularly for mental and substance use disorder, provided. So, and so that's one of the, the challenges in rural communities is um, the availability of these resources. And I think some of our panelists talked about, you know, the ac access to the workforce, um, specialized, qualified, mm -hmm. um, you know, workforce, um, you know, in these rural communities. Um, the issue that you know the 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 service provider agency may also be co-located with um, another. Um, you know, service provider. And mm -hmm. so the issue was stigma. You know, if I'm walking into this agency, mm -hmm. everybody in my community is going to know what I'm in, going in there for. So those are some of the concerns that we yeah. have. Mm -hmm. And um, in terms of non-communicable diseases with mental health and, and substance mm -hmm. use disorders are, um, I suspect, uh, Mary, that they're particularly challenging uh, in terms of the provision of services. There, they are, and as you know, Karen mentioned, one of the issues is stigma. I mean, people don't want to walk through a lot of doors, which is one of the beauties of you know collaborative care with putting behavioral health in a primary care like an FQHC, because and, and people tell tell us what that is to our. Audience. I'm sorry, <laughs> it is a federally qualified health center um, that typically is in a rural area, um, that. A number of them, at least in West Virginia, have mm -hmm. got behavioral health mm -hmm. um, yeah. collaborative care, which means that when a patient comes back from, you know, the front desk, you don't know if they're going back to see the, you know, radiologist or the lab or where they're going, so that it totally eliminates stigma. Very good. Which is, you know, a beautiful way to provide services in rural areas. Um, but all the things that we have talked about do indeed create problems with people seeking services, but stigma is huge, especially with addiction. And Helena, do, uh, do other uh, entities within the community, we've talked about the community health centers mm -hmm. and, and how we're trying to integrate more services into that, but other structures within the community also need to, to participate, as you have mentioned, such as the churches and other nonprofits as well? And I think in American Indian communities, um, it's very important to have a cultural component in the treatment and also to engage the elders because the elders really walk up the path and creates a very good community for people in recovery and coming back. And I think the issue of stigma, I think, is very important, but the acceptance of when you recover and the elder takes you under their wing, you have a much better way and likelihood of recovering than if you do not work with the elder. I think that is very important in Indian country. And, and it, does it take a lot to get that whole 
tribe engaged and get the elder engaged in these services? Is it difficult or is it a path that is, that is uh, uh, one that is accepted and, and, and welcome? And I would say that it's more difficult not to. I would say that if you follow the way of thinking that you engage with the community rather than telling the community what to do, you will have much quicker and much better access to care and support around you than if you don't. So I, in our department, we work with the model of community-based participatory programming, and I think that is crucial for success in American Indian communities. We'll be right back. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has taken many steps to address the opioid epidemic, including expanding access to medication-assisted treatment. For example, qualified physicians who can prescribe buprenorphine can apply to increase their patient limit, which should expand access to this evidence-based treatment. Rural health care practitioners can also download SAMHSA's new free app, MADX. This mobile app will give providers, regardless of location, immediate access to vital information about medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder. This app really fills a gap in the tools available to providers. It enhances the ability of physicians and other healthcare practitioners to provide effective, evidence-based, and in some cases, life-saving treatment to people with opioid use disorders. More broadly, HHS has also provided new funding to community health centers across the country to increase substance use disorder treatment services. This will expand medication-assisted treatment of opioid use disorders in underserved areas, including rural and frontier communities. My family and friends are always with me, no matter where I may be. Sharing stories from home helps me sustain my recovery from my mental and substance use disorder. Hey Hi, Join the voices for recovery. Our families, our stories, our recovery. For confidential information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral, for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Welcome back. Mary, I just want to touch on, uh, we talked a little bit, uh, and you mentioned the, the role of the faith community. Can we go back to that and, and really expand on it in terms of how it supports the behavioral health components uh, uh, that the health, local community health center may, may address. In that, in, in, you know, especially in Appalachian culture, um, it is, it, if you have to go outside your family, they will often go to, you know, a pastor, yes. a spiritual right. leader, a minister, because that is acceptable. So that one of the things that can address, you know, act, actually getting services and, and destigmatizing is to involve the, the you know, the faith-based community in providing assistance, knowing where help is available, um, mm -hmm. normalizing getting either medical or behavioral health, especially behavioral health, but also in, in helping to destigmatize addiction. Mm -hmm. Because if, if you educate your faith-based folks they can talk with, with their you know, communities and their congregations about the disease of addiction and how to get help because it is absolutely rampant so that you know, it's critical that we involve our faith-based communities. I know that SAMHSA supports uh, through the National Association of Children of Alcoholics uh, we support uh, the training of clergy mm -hmm. in the area of yes. substance use disorders and mental health mm -hmm. as well. And, and I think this is one of the main reasons is mm -hmm. that indeed they are one of the ones that can, that can do the, the outreach. Um, and Helena, what other um, training programs are there? Are there some for, for that you know of through the ATTCs? Because I know that you're, yeah. you're with the Indian, but, but there are other efforts that are ongoing mm -hmm. through the Addiction Technology mm -hmm. Transfer Centers. Um, are there other efforts to train clergy in this, in this area? And there are specifically certain times of the year when we reach out to the clergy. And of course, that's Recovery Month where we find it very important to provide the clergy with uh, talking points so they can include it in their sermons. Mm -hmm. 
and also be prepared when there are questions for the from the congregation. Um, also, I think it's important to celebrate recovery and to engage uh, the faith community in that celebration, and especially during Recovery Month, but I think other part times of the year as well. And the ATTCs are very often involved in that. But I think, in addition, um, we as ATTC directors try to reach out to the community around the clergy and also to the um, mutual self-help group communities because they are very often meeting in the churches mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and yes, a lot yes. of times that's where you can provide information and we look at it from a very specific point of view that we maintain that connection Absolutely. very much. Mm -hmm. Very good. Let's move on now. We know for a fact that we've got the community health centers mm -hmm. that have uh, incorporated behavioral health mm -hmm. service delivery systems, and many of them are trying mm -hmm. to broaden and expand mm -hmm. upon, yes. uh, if we truth be told. Uh, and then um, beyond that, we see all these new technologies. So Walter, what types of new technologies such as telemental health are being provided uh, through the Indian Health Service or through other means that you may know of? So within Indian Health Service, actually a division of behavioral health, um, we've got the Telebehavioral Health Center of Excellence. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Chris Four runs that out of uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico and works closely with the University of New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And he, I think he's really done a fabulous job of, of building that, that outreach um, because it allows uh, specialists that maybe wouldn't be able to live in, in, in a remote area um, to provide services in that remote of an area. Uh, it allows the, the clients to have access to them. So they can literally have that face-to-face um, through video conferencing um, with the specialists. Um, typically what we see is that the clients will go to that uh, clinic because that's their, that's their resource. That's, mm -hmm. that's where they need help, mm -hmm. so they go there for help. Um, regardless of what that help is. And sometimes if it's a behavioral health issue or substance use disorder issue, then we can connect them with the telehealth, um, get the specialists there to, to provide those services. And they also uh, are able to provide consultation with the, the primary care doctors mm -hmm. there too. And so, they do it all through online All through connections. online, all, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's been a, a real, I think, blessing in that mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, we're able to actually get them services where in the past it just, we wouldn't have been able to do that. Mm -hmm. And so, to be clear, you may have a room where there's a computer and the person does come to the clinic, but the service is delivered uh, via, via online services. Correct. Excellent, correct. excellent. Yes. And Karen, you've done a lot of research in this. How, how um, broad is this practice around the nation? So we, we do have a number of communities across, uh, rural communities across the country who have implemented behavior, you know, telehealth telemedicine um, programs, you know, but I think the broader thing as we talk about, you know, the delivery of services, um, you know, we focus on issues, what I call the five A's, right, which is uh, accessibility, availability, acceptability, um, appropriateness, and affordability. Right, so as we are looking, whether it be, be you know telehealth or you know faith-based um, services, how are those services provided in rural communities so that they're meeting the criteria for those five A's? Um, you know, and when we talk about accessibility, it is you know tra issues of transportation. Mm -hmm. How are you breaking down those barriers to ensure that individuals are able to access services appropriately? You know, the availability piece comes in as we look at the workforce and the the um, the use of technology. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as well as just the trained. Um, you know, the professionals mm -hmm. that are providing the services. And then this piece about acceptability is how are we reducing the stigma, right? So even as we look at a telebehavioral health or telemedicine, is this the most appropriate way to provide services um, for, you know, a, a community or individuals who may have some problems with the fact that, you know, the person that's providing the services to them, they can't reach out and touch them. You know, it's by video. Mm -hmm. So their whole issues are around trust, um, you know, and, 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 that, and continuity sometimes. 
issues. And then the appropriateness is that, you know, are we meeting those specific and unique needs, whether they are at the cultural level, the linguistic level, and both? And then, of course, affordability, right? How do we provide How the How do we get the systems right. in exactly. there so they can exactly. use them? But, but I think Karen touched mm -hmm. on, a, on a very good point, which is the social acceptance dimension mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to the services. And indeed, let's face it, we are going to have to go to telemedicine mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. we really want to reach 100% penetration in, 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 in those areas mm -hmm. and, and have access to everything. Do you have any examples from West Virginia, Mary, in terms of what you may have done to ameliorate some of, some of the resistance that there might be to telehealth or telemedicine? Really, I have noticed that there's more resistance among providers than Absolutely. clients. <laughs> you know, because yeah. in, you know, in behavioral health, Health, it's a graying field you know my clients are you know doing this all the time um, the the beauty of, of you know telebehavioral health is you know if I have a mom who doesn't have a babysitter or she doesn't have money to put mm -hmm. gas in the car you know if you've got a secure platform which mm -hmm. I do she only has to have a smartphone mm -hmm. or a computer I can be in my office, she can be in her home, which may be in the middle of nowhere. Um, because, you know, it, and, and I would expect that older folks would be more of a problem, but as grandparents like myself start Skyping with our grandkids yes. across right. the country, we're going to habituate to it. That's correct. You know, and it's, it's more and more common every day, and it... it is the only way we can provide services. It's the only way we can reach a decent penetration level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the role of the public, rural public health clinic in, in meeting the behavioral health needs in, in frontier communities, is there more work that needs to be done in that area? One thing that I really worry about when it comes to rural and frontier areas is that sometimes the counselors, uh, the professionals, are not as prepared and educated to do the job that comes in through that door. And one of the things that I have seen a lot of is because they have, even though they are working in a healthcare setting, um, they are feeling very pressured. Mm -hmm. There is very little uh, what we would say clinical supervision accessible to them. So there is a lot of turnover. And I think, at least when I think about my job as an ATTC director, that's one of the things I think is very important. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back. We see Counseling Solutions Treatment Centers as sort of a hub where folks struggling with opiate addiction can start getting stable and then get the case management services, the counseling services, the medical attention that they need and or the referrals to places that can do that if we can't uh, so that they can get back on, on with normal life and on you know what we call the road to recovery. We are truly in North Georgia, the Appalachian uh, community, people will drive for a couple of hours to get here because there are no services. It's a two hour drive and it's worth, it's worth it to me. Rural areas like Counseling Solutions Treatment Centers, Chatsworth, Serves, are have their complications and have their challenges. You have um, a less dense population, so a lot of companies and a lot of people that provide treatment don't want to come into that rural area um, because they just don't feel like there's numbers enough to be a profitable business. We were coming into a county where in our county and at the time all the counties that touch us uh, had no opioid treatment program. So we expected growth, but what we've seen has been unprecedented. Um, that we've admitted over 300 people um, in a matter of 10 months in a very rural area is way more than what we expected. You don't find a lot of people up here with degrees. You don't find a lot of people that are certified, even just addiction specific, much less medication assistance. 
Um, so it's always difficult to bring staff in. Part of that is because there haven't been job opportunities in these areas. We've got to bring effective treatments for mental health and substance abuse to our rural communities. Um, there's just, we're not going to turn any of these problems around until all of our communities are adequately served. Staying on course without support is tough. With help from family and community, you get valuable support for recovery from a mental or substance use disorder. Join the Voices for Recovery. Visible. Vocal. Valuable. For confidential information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. I've been in recovery for 22 years now. Um, got sober when I was 34. And, you know, my recovery is everything. Because having grown up in an alcoholic addicted home, I would never have the life I have now if I hadn't, you know, become addicted. But you know, I kid and tell people that, you know, I, I've changed everything except my gender since I got clean and sober. Um, but it, it, it's simple, but it is not easy. It's incredibly difficult, which I think that, that makes it a little hard for um, folks who have not dealt with, with addiction to understand, um, which is why I think sometimes people lose patience with us. But you know, when we get clean and sober, all of the things that drove us to become addicted, you know, the pain, the trauma, um, you know, the isolation, don't just vanish. That takes years of work, years. Um, and I think that sometimes folks who don't know I'm in recovery, you know, docs that I work with and other um, counselors who don't know me well, wonder where the passion comes from. <laughs> but for me, I mean, I've been there. I am those people. Recovery has allowed me to, to you know, to give back in, in a very different way um, than f some folks can. By being able to, you know, go back to school and change professions and, and give back professionally as well as personally, um, it has had a dramatic impact on my life. Um, you know, I, through recovery, have become part of my family, become part of, of my, um, you know, greater community, but much more significantly in terms of impact on my life, you know, a, a part of the recovering community and a part of the professional, you know, recovering community and, and professional treatment and prevention community, which is, you know, extremely, it's a blessing. You know, for Folks in, in rural areas who are struggling with addiction, please, you know, don't give up. There is help. Um, there are all kinds of resources now, even for areas that don't have 12-step meetings. And in West Virginia, there are some of those. But there are online meetings and, and you know, in the rooms. Um, there are helplines. There are, West Virginia has a helpline where you can call and find out where you can get help. People in recovery will come get you. Um, so there is help. Your path to recovery isn't like mine, but when you need a hand with a mental health issue or substance use disorder, reach out until you find one. For information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Welcome back. Uh, Mary, we were talking about one of the elements that we may have left out, which is school-based efforts. And, mm -hmm. and let's focus on that a little bit because we need to get to the particulars of, of really dealing with the adolescents and the younger mm -hmm. uh, gr age groups. You know, school-based to me is part of reaching people where they are. Mm -hmm. And I mean, where do you find children? In schools. There's a, an, an enormous movement, I think nationally and especially in West Virginia, to put school-based behavioral health in as many schools as possible mm -hmm.
because relative to substance abuse and mental health prevention starts now in first grade, mm -hmm. kindergarten. In order to reach these children, we have to be in the schools. In order for them to get behavioral health and substance abuse in a lot of our really rural areas, it has to be in their schools. And that is one area where, you know, uh, telecounseling can help because if the counselor isn't there, you know, I've gotten a lot of calls, you know, f when I was at um, rural health and, and, you know, a remote area where the, a, a child was in, in crisis and they didn't have a counselor on site. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Walter, um, are there programs within the Indian Health Service that address school-based efforts for younger audiences? Yeah, and I'm excited because uh, IHS just recently signed with uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs a memorandum of, of agreement that we would start to embed um, mental health practitioners within the Indian Health Schools that, that they do cover. So um, we're covering the schools as well as the youth detention centers and we're going to be providing mental health services there as well. Um, in addition to that, we've recently increased some of our funding in regards to uh, Generation Indigenous, which is the, the Indian youth, and we're providing um, money for, for them to develop preventive type, uh, preventative type uh, measures uh, out in their community that they think work best for them. So again, kind of what we're seeing with that is a lot of the elders are coming in mm -hmm. and they're getting involved with that. And what we've discovered, I think, um, is that we're seeing that, that culture is prevention. And so um, it's a way that, that we can address that that, that culture piece, which is so important, and also kind of marry it with the prevention and how do we get that long-term um, um, abstinence and, and, and assistance when they need it. And you know, culture is prevention, but it, our prevention services, let's talk a little bit about that, because it's not all about waiting for us to treat the problem, but really in the, in the prevention efforts, mm -hmm. um, uh, are we talking about using the same systems of, of telehealth and et cetera, Karen? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the interesting conversation as we talk about delivery of services and, you know, cultural and I would add linguistic competence mm -hmm. um, with those services, um, you know, I think it's important for us to really involve the community, the families and these youth that are going to be the recipients of services. Um, you know, to help develop what, or to, you know, decide what those those services and supports look like. Um, you know, uh, again, you know, the, the linguistic piece of it is because in mainstream, you know, we, we have terms for, you know, um, you know, symptoms or behavioral health um, issues or concerns that um, don't resonate with mm -hmm. a, a diverse mm -hmm. population, you know. Um, you know, things, you know, some of the, the language that's even used mm -hmm. in the systems as treatment, it, it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. far beyond, um, you know, what a you know, parent or... Can can, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it's really about making those services accessible and the language that we're using and incorporating, um, you know, children and families, you mm -hmm. know, so that we talk about this um, family involvement, you know, family mm -hmm. engagement, youth involvement, those types of things. So, Angelina, where can individuals who want to know more, particularly this, this program is, is viewed not only by our broader audience, but, but it's also used many times, you know, to instruct counselors. Are there resources that you know of where people can actually go and, and really begin to learn more about how to be culturally sensitive, about how to really begin to deliver these, these uh, uh, efforts, you know, in order to expand access to care? I think there are um, rural health organizations that provide a lot of very important information. I also think, of course, of my ATTC group because the regions have specific things that they include in their web pages, in their training events. Mm -hmm. And I think um, communities can develop programs that will be much easier implemented if they are shared in the community. And I'm sort of, we talked a little bit about adolescents, and I think we need to really ask them also more than we do. Mm -hmm. sure. What is it that they want, and how do they want to 
spread the information, mm -hmm. uh, what is important for them to know. So I think the engagement in the community yes. is just mm -hmm. as important okay. as us coming in and telling them. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm also thinking about the radar system, mm -hmm. because what that is, are a library system with information mm -hmm. about substance abuse, behavioral health, mental health, and- That everyone can access. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. They're connected to libraries in their community. So I really recommend that too. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mary, yes. we know now that there are these programs, what we have not talked about are efforts for individuals in recovery. I mm -hmm. know that you're in recovery mm -hmm. yourself, and maybe you'd like to talk to us about your own personal experience and what you may have gone through in trying to get services. Well, I have um, kidded and said, you know, I, I wish I had known about Alatot. Mm -hmm. um, grew up in an alcoholic home. Um, my mom also had mental health issues. So that I've been, you know, studying this since I was in diapers. There were no school-based services, mm -hmm. really. I mean, if the only mm -hmm. contact I remember with a counselor was, you know, ACT time. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, someone could have, you know, reached me earlier with prevention efforts. Um, because like a lot of children of alcoholics, you know, Claudia Black's book, mm -hmm. It'll Never Happen to Me. Mm -hmm. um, I had to do my own experiential research. How did it happen to you? Um, I added enough liquid, basically. Um, added enough chemicals. I think what, what happens is because of lack of education, um, what I did not know is that there is indeed a hereditable element to addiction as well as the the mm -hmm. setup you know the the trauma the isolation all of that stuff how that old comes. were you when you started to um, use substances eight eight years old mm -hmm. and you became sober or 22 years ago 22 years ago uh -huh. 22 years ago but i think mm -hmm. that if you know the all the factors and and you know gabor mate talks about you know pain and isolation being two of the primary drivers, mm -hmm. we can reach kids and address that isolation. Okay. We can offer services that address that pain. And how did you seek services? I mean, did, did you uh, use mutual support or were you able to uh, have a significant person that, that intervened and, and, and helped you through your recovery process? I had a, um, not a, a, you know, minister in my church mm -hmm. who was aware of and spoke of, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous. Okay. Um, that was where I, I learned about that um, and, and was able to attend those and, and discovered that these people had hope. Excellent. And, you know, from there, you know, sought help, sought out a counselor, sought out, you know, um, some professional treatment. Thank you, Mary. Um, and Helena, very quickly, um, peer to peer, mm -hmm. do we have models uh, for training within the rural community? And is it a different training program or is it basically the same? We have models for that. We have models actually in Indian country and we have models in rural areas. And they are very, very successful. And I'm also going to suggest the community health workers that you see very extensively work in Alaska, and we have very good results. So yes, peer-to-peer -peer and community health workers are really very important. Very good, and I'm gonna come back to peer-to-peer -to -peer because I think that that's one area where we can definitely broaden the, the service mm -hmm. pool uh, within a community. We'll be right back. It takes many hands to build a healthy life. Recovery from mental and substance use disorders is possible with the support of my community. Join the voices for recovery. Visible. Vocal. Valuable. For confidential information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.
was really hard to find a program that was medication assisted. I mean, the closest one is probably a good 45 minute drive for me. I went to rehab a couple times and I've been, you know, I went to a mental facility for a detox and nothing was ever as comfortable as it was here at Counseling Solutions. We, I mean, they were really supportive. I didn't feel like nobody was judging me. This was my last resort. I knew if this didn't work, then not, it was gonna be over for me. But it did work, it's worked wonders. I mean, I've gotten one of my children back and I mean, I've been working since January. I mean, I've been doing really good. I just love the people here. I, I love them. I mean, they're just like family. That keeps me coming back. We don't treat anybody like a number. Um, our focus is to know people, to get to understand people, to understand their struggles, to work with them again through the psychotherapy and, and ensure that they're getting what they need out of this. Many of our patients have had no contact with any area of health care for years and sometimes in their whole lives until they meet with us. And so you are serving a population that often feels that society has forgotten about them or that society doesn't care about them. We create that sense of family for them. We don't want them to think that they come here and it's punitive in any way. Where I was at was just a, a money making. It was a job where here they care. Uh, that's what I found. And I would probably drive four hours one way if I had to. <laughs> it just means the world to me to remember when I was on the other side of the desk, so to speak, and how broken I was at that time. And to realize that I now have the opportunity to offer and help people find the same wholeness I now have. Since I started here at Counseling Solutions, uh, my life has changed tremendously. I mean, it for the better. I've got goals now. I have a future now. That's not something that I could say 10 months ago that I have a future. There was no tomorrow before. And so I've got a tomorrow now. We know that recovery does not happen in isolation, but recovery happens in relationships with others. And that having the support of friends, families, communities, having the support of other people, other peers who have lived experience of mental health and addictions is really critical. Now in rural communities, it's an added factor because of the geographic isolation. So there are things like transportation, other community organizations, and increasingly through the use of technology that can help reduce those distances so that people can find the community, the relationships, and social support they need. It is amazing to see how technology is really revolutionizing behavioral health care today. Through the use of internet, you can find online support groups. You can also find support groups that are available in your local communities. We also know the development of mobile apps, applications, are huge these days, and the kind of things there where you can find support uh, support groups in your community. We know the Veterans Administration has even developed applications for post-traumatic stress disorder. So using these technologies is one way to build those communities and social support. For more information on National Recovery Month, to find out how to get involved or to locate an event near you, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. Welcome back. Walter, uh, the, the element of peer-to-peer of -peer and community support, mm -hmm. uh, I suspect you're also working with that, and, and what are some of the resources in that area? Um, yes, actually we are, and, and to, to Anne Helena's point, um, Alaska has kind of a, a great model that, that mm -hmm. they've developed, and, and part of IHS now, um, we're looking at that that model and being able to maybe start to incorporate something very similar at a national level. And so it would and be And what that, does the model consist of? So it would be, it would be a, a series of trainings um, that would then 
help these people get prepared to go out into the community and address the, the, the members in the community that maybe don't have access, don't have transportation. Mm -hmm. So they would be able to go out into the community. If someone was having some sort of mental health crisis, they can go out to that person's home and, and basically evaluate, make some determinations and kind of help go from yeah. there. So mm -hmm. it's really this, this um, we don't need to have a, a four year school in order to get these people certified. And so it's, it's, they're not at a level where they're, you know, um, uh, masters or doctors or anything like that, but they serve but they're community -based vital individuals. Role, yeah. vital well, role. Yeah. And that also Cultural speaks brokers. to our workforce issues right. because mm -hmm. right. especially in substance abuse, you know, a peer to a peer mm -hmm. or a recovery coach is often far more effective than you know, a master's level or doctor level provider right. who hasn't got the lived experience. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, recovery coaches right. are worth their weight in gold because mm -hmm. they are trained people with lived experience mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. can, you know, fill in the gaps because uh, uh, there are not enough right. professional providers in an area. Mm -hmm. But they can can meet the needs of the client so that they have a better chance of success and achieving long term recovery. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yep. Um, we have not talked about. Um, the whole notion of, of suicide and suicide mm. prevention mm -hmm. within rural communities. Mm -hmm. I think it is a very critical aspect of, of a service delivery. Mm -hmm. What do individuals need to look to as, as we look for models that, that are uh, accessible to rural individuals? Mary. I think that um, initiatives need to be in schools because I think that in rural areas, you know, that's the best way to reach our kids. I think that prevention is vital. Um, I think that public information is critical. Um, using technology as, as an, out, you know, an outreach mechanism, mm -hmm. because if people can, can find the help they need, they don't reach that point, but you've got to get to them before they reach that point. Yes. Uh, and I want to add something to that. I think suicide is a very community devastation mm -hmm. and it affects mm -hmm. communities on a very deep level. And we have been involved in a project in a tribe where there was this very serious suicide epidemic and we mm -hmm. haven't actually been present other than every single week we have got together uh, providers, schools, elders, um, national expert on suicide, and kept talking and providing ideas mm -hmm. about what can you do mm -hmm. to prevent this in the future. And that's when we realized that the elders are very important, mm -hmm. the kids really need to have an input, and you see that when the community come together mm -hmm. and decide to do whatever the community thinks is the right thing, you see a reduction in suicide. But yeah, it's something you have to keep doing, because if you stop, it comes mm -hmm. back again. Uh, well, you know, I think the, the, the major issue, and I think you've touched on it, and Helena is, is uh, and I'm going to, to you, Walter, is that within native country, there is a tremendous problem with youth suicide uh, currently, correct? We've, we've had clusters. Mm -hmm. um, it, again, right now, one of the programs that we've implemented is the zero suicide training. And, and we, are allow, um, we have a number of tribes that are engaged with us at, at our IHS level. Um, to get them training on how to do, mm -hmm. get into the communities and talk to the community members and, and, you know, make sure that they're kind of keeping a finger on the pulse. And, you know, when we talked about um, what do the community providers have, mm -hmm. one of the things that the community providers to do, can do is really they know what's going on. They know what's going on in their community and they can typically react a lot faster. So it's yeah. some training that we're doing on our end. Um, we've got a Pam Indehorn out of our uh, out of a Division of Behavioral Health is our suicide prevention coordinator now. Mm -hmm. um, so we've taken a serious look at that. We haven't had the clusters recently, but to the mm -hmm. point when you look away, does it pop yeah. back up? Right. So ever di vigilant, um, and, and so we're trying to make some, some adjustments and, and make sure that we continue to keep that out front. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think Anne Helena's point about 
ask the community. Who knows better yes. what they need, what's going to work mm -hmm. best than the community themselves. Yeah. Yes, I believe it's really about engaging community members in this. Mm -hmm. yeah. this and I'm thinking about, we forget in rural communities the farmers. Exactly. And farmers have a very high suicide rate. And what we've seen with recovery coaches and with peer support is that they are much more able to talk directly to the farmer yeah, than anybody outside because the farmer doesn't like to have the experience of being depressed, upset, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but a community member, they will talk to. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I, I absolutely agree in, in, in what you said, but let's face it, you know, um, how do we address the issue of the generational mm -hmm. yeah. uh, uh, issues that are within the workforce you know many people are retiring how mm -hmm. how can we really begin to are, are we addressing that as we look forward to providing better services in the rural community i'm going to start with you mary well i mean it's a real issue because you know the the work that we're talking about doing is very difficult work um, and it is typically low pay so that it is a matter of um destigmatizing the provision of services so that people are willing to go into service provision because what we need is is for the older folks like me to be able to pass on what we have learned you know from our mentors and if we don't have another generation that can't happen and there will be an even greater workforce issue than there is now and that would be catastrophic well, talking about those resources, are there any resources, and Helena, that you can think of in terms of developing the workforce within Indian country or outside the Indian country within the rural communities? And when you and Mary talk about um, it's tough work, it's not really well paid, and of course we never became counselors to be rich. We became counselors. <laughs> we did, we goofed. <laughs> yes, we became counselors because we were committed. Mm -hmm. And I think that commitment is very important for us to nurture. And I believe in giving as many opportunities mm -hmm. for support mm -hmm. and clinical supervision mm -hmm. and interactions with yes. other professionals as possible in addition to training. Because of course training is important, but it's those heart-wrenching situations mm -hmm. when you are faced with someone who's suicidal or have a very bad family crisis. It's very hard to leave that situation if you can't talk to somebody Thank about you. what you experienced. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Walter, Indian Health Service, are we doing anything related to workforce development? We are. Um, we've got a couple of programs. We've got a, a, um, a loan repayment program mm -hmm. um, and we've also right. got a recruitment uh, program as well and so we try to um, go out, find the folks um, and, and see, um, you know, Come on in. I think part of the challenge is if you can get somebody that's from that community, right. they'll stay mm -hmm. in that exactly. community. Yes. Yes. And so trying yeah. to nurture and build that as well is, mm -hmm. is always kind of an important task, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. um, and, and congratulations on 22 years. That's awesome. <laughs> yes. I think those are the people, too, Absolutely. when we start looking at who are the ones that are in recovery, that have been successful, that maybe have some sort of passion, and mm -hmm. see if we can't figure out a way to identify those folks and bring them along because you don't want to lose the institutional no, knowledge. Absolutely. No, absolutely. but also, I mean, I, I now have a uh, drug court graduate who just finished her MSW. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, paying for that and supporting someone mm -hmm. while they do that right. is, is mm -hmm. fabulous. Mm -hmm. You know, she was able to do that, which is just magnificent. That's excellent. But I think there's one thing we tend to forget, and that's recruitment. Mm -hmm. yes. Because if, you, if we think back about when we were teenagers ourselves, we didn't wake up one morning and said, I am going to be a substance abuse counselor or a mental health counselor. You have to really think about ways to engaging yeah. mm -hmm. adolescents, high school students in the idea of becoming 
a counselor. Absolutely, and, and not, not only counselor. that, and not only that, it's really getting to the to the to the youth and 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 young adults that are in the schools themselves, mm -hmm. and we're doing that through a program through NADAC. In certain communities, we're going out and talking That's to true. sophomores and juniors and freshmen, you know, uh, about this field and and hoping mm -hmm. of uh, of engaging them. I think this has been. A uh, great opportunity to broach this subject, and I want to thank you for being here. Uh, and I want to remind our audience that September is National Recovery Month. Uh, you can get more information at recoverymonth.gov, and we want you to be engaged, be supportive, and to list all of the events and activities throughout the year that you're engaged in related to recovery at recoverymonth.gov. I want to thank you for being here. It's been a great show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To watch this program or other programs in the Road to Recovery series, visit the website at recoverymonth.gov. My story is yours. I am a mother. I'm a father, a son, a daughter. I am in recovery from a mental illness, a substance use disorder. With support from family and community, we, we are, are victorious. victorious. Join the Voices for Recovery, our families, our stories, our recovery. For confidential information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Every September, National Recovery Month provides an opportunity for communities like yours to raise awareness of mental and substance use disorders, to highlight the effectiveness of prevention, treatment, and recovery services, and show that people can and do recover. In order to help you plan events and activities in commemoration of this year's Recovery Month observance, the free online Recovery Month kit offers ideas, materials, and tools for planning, organizing, and realizing an event or outreach campaign that matches your goals and resources. To obtain an electronic copy of this year's Recovery Month kit and access other free publications and materials on prevention, recovery, and treatment services, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov or call 1-800-662-HELP.